of an ongoing series of distinguished speakers presented by the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. The broadcast of this program is made possible by the generous contributions of the members of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Strobe Talbot, editor-at-large, Time Magazine, spoke before council members and guests on February 18, 1992, at the Sheridan Inner Harbor Hotel. The speaker's address is entitled, The New Russia and the New World. Introducing Mr. Talbot is Sheila K. Riggs, President, Diversified Health Services Incorporated, and co-chair of the Board of Trustees of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Strobe Talbot became Time Magazine's editor-at-large in September of 1989. Prior to that, he had been Washington bureau chief for five years. His earlier assignments for time were diplomatic correspondent between 1977 and 1984, White House correspondent during the Ford administration, State Department correspondent when Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State, and Eastern European correspondent for two years in the early 1970s. Talbot has translated and edited two volumes of Nikita Khrushchev's memoirs. His expertise in arms control and Soviet affairs has been evidenced in a number of articles and four books. Endgame, The Inside Story of Salt II, which was published in 1979, and Deadly Gambits, published in 1984. He is also the author of The Russians and Reagan, which came out in 1984, and co-author of Reagan and Gorbachev, published in 1987. His latest book is Master of the Game, Paul Nietzsche and the Nuclear Peace, published in 1988. Mr. Talbot has twice won the Edward Weintal Prize for distinguished reporting on foreign affairs and diplomacy, once in 1980 and once again in 1985. He is a trustee of Yale University in the Hotchkiss School and is currently on the board of directors of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. He's a native of Dayton, Ohio, and a graduate of Hotchkiss and Yale. He spent three years after graduating from Yale as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Would you join me in welcoming him to the council this evening, Strobe Talbot. As you can tell, I'm sure from Mrs. Riggs's kind introduction, I have the rather peculiar professional distinction of having devoted much, I'm tempted to say even most, of my career as a journalist and writer to the study of a country that no longer exists. On Christmas Day, a little less than three months ago, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics passed into memory, or as a Marxist might say, it was cast onto the dust heap of history. Yet there is still a very large country over there, the largest on earth. You can call it the direct descendant of the USSR. You can call it the ghost of the USSR, or you can merely call it Russia. And that country, as its predecessor did, continues to preoccupy us, and more these days in some ways than in a very long time. For example, Secretary of State Baker's visit to Moscow is prominently reported on the front page of today's Sun, as well as of my own hometown paper, The Washington Post. As it happens, it was just a week ago yesterday that I returned from my own latest visit to Moscow. So I had a chance 
to run a bit of a reality check on the image that has formed in our minds about what is going on over there. Now that image, of course, the one that flickers out at us from the television screen nightly, as well as from the newspapers daily, is overwhelmingly bleak. We see in the coverage of the former Soviet Union the collapse of an economy. We see the frustration and anger of consumers, workers, average citizens. We see the breakdown of what used to be a stable, if stagnant, political order. And we see the rise of ethnic tensions. And perhaps mo most ominous of all, we see a tug of war between two separate countries that weren't even recognized as such as recently as a couple of months ago, Russia and Ukraine. They're at each other's throats over the disposition of what is still a superpower arsenal. Now, I'm not going to stand here this evening and try to deny to you that those problems are very real and very serious. Nor am I going to downplay the problems. But personally, I'm still clinging by my fingernails to some hope for Russians and for the other citizens of the old Soviet Union. And I want to try in the next several minutes before we go to a more open discussion to try to share with you the reasons for my tentative, qualified, cautious hope, and perhaps see if I can persuade you that there's some reason not to be completely pessimistic and even apocalyptic about what's going to happen in that part of the world. On the economy, which is absolutely key, let me make two points. First, with everyone doting on the image of empty shelves in the state stores, there is a very understandable tendency to think back to the pre-Gorbachev period as somehow the good old days for the Soviet economy. Well, they were actually the bad old days. I've been going to that country for 24 years, since 1968. And believe me, I remember from my own earlier trips scenes every bit as grim as the ones that we're seeing now. Only back then, we and the Russians themselves took those scenes for granted. The second point I want to make is this. There are already the beginnings, just the beginnings, of the mechanisms and mentality of free, econo free market economics in the former Soviet Union. When I arrived in Moscow a little over two weeks ago, I did what I almost always do. Like most people who get on airplanes and travel halfway around the world, I suffer from jet lag. And the way I try to deal with jet lag when I land someplace is stay awake until that evening so I can go to bed at more or less a normal time by that schedule. And what I do is get out and walk around the city. And when I go to Moscow, I always make a point of trying to find the nearest open air market. In the case of this last trip, I went to the so-called Central Market, about a mile from the hotel where I was staying, where farmers come to sell on a private basis. Now, in contrast to that state grocery store with empty shelves and long lines that we all see night after night after night on television, and by the way, it's pretty often the, the same store because it happens that there's one state store that is with an easy walking distance for all four American television networks. <laughs> the central market, the private market that I visited was a cornucopia of produce, varied, plentiful, and, to be sure, expensive. The farmers were charging what the market would bear. Now, to be sure, 
the customers were grumbling. But as markets like that proliferate, prices will come down. Gradually, if, and it's a big if, I acknowledge, this can happen in an environment of social peace and civil order, then, and only then, the invisible hand of Adam Smith may eventually replace the iron fist of Karl Marx. Of course, the process of transition from communism to capitalism is going to involve a great deal of hardship. And I do not want to make light of that. It's very easy for somebody like me, with a wallet full of traveler's checks and greenbacks, to fly into Moscow and spend a week or 10 days there, and then come home to this society and say, it's not so very bad. For those people, it is very, very difficult indeed, especially for elderly pensioners and others who are on fixed incomes in a society with virtually no social net at all, no unemployment insurance, for example. But the positive that I would stress to keep in mind alongside of these images that we have of the terrible shortages, the long lines, and the bitter complaints. The positive is, in a way, a negative. That is, it's something that has not happened. There is, as yet, no sign of an immediate danger of massive unrest and violence. Now, that might seem like rather cold comfort in a cold winter. But keep in mind that there were some pretty dire predictions about what was going to happen when prices were allowed to shoot up at the beginning of January. And mercifully, those predictions have so far not come true. Now, some people attribute even that good news to what is essentially bad news. They attribute the fact that there have not been food riots and that kind of thing to the alleged passivity of the Russian character. Well, I think over the past year or so, we have seen the Russians themselves prove that a lot of the stereotypes about their national character are not true. We certainly saw that during the coup last August, when enough Russians poured out in the streets to thwart the military takeover of their country. I would prefer to explain the fact that so far the Russian people seem willing to put up with the terrible hardships that they are being asked to bear. I would attribute it to the fact that many of them realize quite simply that they have no choice, that this is the only way that their society, their economy can make the transition that will be necessary if they're going to achieve a better life. And another factor, too, at least their present hardships are being imposed on them by a government that they elected. And that's a consolation that they never had before. Which brings me to say a few words about the more general political situation in the former USSR. What has happened in the last couple of months, this most extraordinary period in many of our lifetimes, can be summed up in this way. The old Soviet Union, the one that existed until Christmas Day, when the red hammer and sickle flag was lowered from atop the Kremlin for the last time, the old Soviet Union did not make ever political, economic, ethnographic, or any other kind of sense. It was an artificial, essentially unworkable entity. Yet it sat there, occupying a sixth of the Earth's surface, and causing a great deal of trouble for its own people and for the rest of the world for over 70 years. How to explain that? Why did it last so long? There's a one-word answer, 
fear, terror, intimidation, totalitarianism, those were the fuel on which the clunky machinery of that state ran, the glue that kept it together. And Mikhail Gorbachev, to his undying credit, dismantled the Ministry of Fear. And as a result, the whole creaky, bloated edifice collapsed. It came crashing to the ground. Exit the USSR. Enter something called the Commonwealth of Independent States. I still have to look down to my notes when I say it. It's a phrase that some of us, myself included, are having a lot of trouble getting used to. But I don't think it'll probably be around for all that long. It's a very strange designation. If Winston Churchill were around, he might call it a misnomer wrapped in a contradiction inside of a political fiction. <laughs> for starters, a commonwealth presupposes that there is wealth to have in common. <laughs> Whereas what the pieces of the former Soviet Union have most in common is poverty, mutual resentment, and mistrust. But the misnomer and the contradiction go further than that. The former republics that now call themselves states really aren't independent of each other at all. After hundreds of years of living under the czars, and more than 70 years of being part of the rigidly centralized Stalinist system, those so-called states are enmeshed in a web of interconnections that cannot possibly be dissolved overnight. Their economies are interlinked, as are their networks of communication, distribution, energy and natural resource supplies, and so on. <clears throat> Disentangling all of those ties that have bound, bound them together for so long can only be a gradual process, or at least it must not be a sudden and abrupt process. Because if the process is short-circuited and it happens very, very quickly, then there's likely to be a terrible explosion of some kind. And it was that realization that led to the founding of the Commonwealth back at the beginning of December. And it essentially was the work of two men, Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia, and Leonid Kravchuk, the president of Ukraine. They got together and cobbled together this thing called the Commonwealth, very much on the spur of the moment and as an expedient, as a gimmick to buy time to tide the republics over while they divide up the spoils of the old union. Now, most problematically, those spoils include nuclear weapons, which are now distributed not just in Russia, but in three other republics. And those spoils also included the Black Sea Fleet, which Russia considers Russian, but awkwardly is home ported in the Ukraine. And this week, yet a new dispute has broken out over the status and future of the Strategic Air Force. Now, my own guess is that Russia will eventually end up with most of that military hardware. Russia is determined to be the successor state to the old Soviet Union a Eurasian superpower, if not a global one. Moreover, it's also my sense that the other republics are reluctantly prepared to accept Russia in that role. What they do not want, however, is for Russia to reestablish the old Russian empire with the republics as vassal states or colonies. The people of Kazakhstan in Central Asia on the border of China just to cite one example, worry that Boris Yeltsin or some successor of his in the Kremlin will annex the northern part of Kazakhstan because its population is overwhelmingly ethnically Russian. 
Similarly, the Ukrainians worry that Moscow will annex the Crimea in the south and the coal fields in the north because, once again, the populations are overwhelmingly Russian. So the question arises, what leverage do the Kazakhs and the Ukrainians have to bargain, both for their freedom and also to fend off Russian expansionism? The answer, of course, is that they've got Soviet nuclear weapons based on their territory and other military assets like the Black Sea Fleet. So those weapons and those units become important pawns in the game that's being played out between Russia and the other members of the Commonwealth. Now, for his part, Boris Yeltsin is hanging fairly tough to make sure that Russia does indeed emerge as strong as possible. But he's also showing considerable statesmanship in the way that he's been able, so far at least, to hold at bay the ultra-nationalists and worse, who now have appeared on the scene in Russia. He's been able to avoid any suggestion that he will try to use the disruption of the current situation and the weakness of Russia's neighbors to expand Russian territory. If he continues in that way, Yeltsin may yet turn out to be not only the first elected Russian leader in a thousand years, but the first non-imperial Russian leader ever. And all of this is to say that while there is plenty of reason to worry about what will happen next in the former Soviet Union, there's also good reason for relief and even celebration about what has happened already. After all, we as Americans have always championed the principle of self-determination. And there's plenty of that over there right now, almost more than they know what to do with. We've also championed democracy. And there's a lot more of that in that part of the world than there used to be. We've championed free market economics, and there's more of that too. The breakup of the USSR is good for our side in another respect, too. A single, monolithic, predatory superpower with a hostile ideology is being replaced by 15 smaller, weaker states that want to be more like us. So let's not give way to the gloom and the despair. Let's not think that there's anything foreordained or unavoidable about the nightmare scenarios that have been sketched out over the past few months, scenarios that conjure up the spectacle of a Yugoslavia-like civil war spread out over 11 time zones with nuclear weapons in the picture. That does not have to happen. Whether it does happen or not depends in part on us. The outside world, notably including the United States, can play an important role in avoiding the worst and keeping Russian reform on track. The danger hanging over the former USSR is, above all, economic. Economics drives politics. About that, at least, Karl Marx was right, even if he was spectacularly wrong about a great deal else. Even the qualified optimism that I've expressed here at the outset of these remarks this evening goes right out the window if there is a total collapse of the economic reform program. And if economic chaos leads to political upheaval or a relapse into a totalitarian dictatorship. While the Yeltsin government is moving basically in the right direction, it desperately needs outside help to keep moving in that direction. That means not just emergency food aid and medical assistance to get through the winter but also a currency stabilization fund underwritten by the indu industrialized democracies. Increased Western government incentives for Western companies to invest and otherwise do business in the old USSR. And most important, I think, a huge program of technical assistance, call it education, to help the people of that part of the world learn essentially from scratch how to overhaul their whole economic culture. That, too, constitutes an urgent and expensive challenge to our government and our private sector alike. Yesterday in Moscow, President Yeltsin pleaded with Secretary Baker for help in all of these areas, as well as for additional credits to purchase grain. Mr. Baker told him basically he'd get back to him after he relays these requests to Washington. 
He made no commitments. Our Secretary of State knows that in the U.S. these days, it is unfashionable and politically risky to appear too enthusiastic about anything that smacks of foreign aid. There's a lot of conventional wisdom evident, I think, in the debates that we've seen played out in New Hampshire over the last couple of months. But with the Cold War over, we've got a huge peace dividend coming to us. And we should spend it on fixing the many things that are wrong with our own economy and our own society. I don't think there's any question that there's a lot of truth in that. But we ought still to be able to afford a sizable participation in an international effort to shore up the economic stability of the former Soviet Union. Not just for humanitarian reasons, although I would like to think that maybe those would have some bearing as well, but also for reasons of self-interest. Let me make that point, and it's the last one that I want to leave with you before we go to our discussion, against the backdrop of the past 100 years. What has happened in the former Soviet Union constitutes a momentous development in world history. We're all privileged to have been alive to see it happen. Only two other events in this century have had similar impact, World War I and World War II. In both those two earlier cataclysms, there was good news and there was bad news. The good news was that our side won. The bad news was that the defeat of one enemy left a vacuum filled by a whole new set of villains whose dictatorial and aggressive policies made another global showdown inevitable. World War I resulted in the dismantlement of the Prussian war machine and the disintegration of the Habsburg Empire. But it also created the conditions out of which Nazism arose. Something similar happened in the case of World War II. It ended in the total destruction of both the Third Reich and the empire of the rising sun. But it made possible Stalin's conquest of Eastern Europe and the triumph of Mao Zedong in China. In short, just as World War I set the stage for World War II, so World War II set the stage for the Cold War. Now the Cold War is over. And once again, we, the good guys, one. But can we, the human race, break the pattern of the past? Can the Cold War end without leading straight into some new, open-ended, extremely dangerous international conflict? During the 40 years of the Cold War, we spent many trillions of dollars deterring the Soviet Union, keeping it from blowing up the world. For a small fraction of that, we've got the challenge now of preventing the former Soviet Union from blowing itself up with the risk of a lot of political as well as literal physical fallout on the rest of the world. So what's at issue here is a matter of cost effectiveness, of not being penny wise and pound foolish, of recognizing that if Russian reform fails and gives way to chaos, or dictatorship, or both. We will find ourselves dragged back into another international mess that will be much more expensive than the cost of keeping the process now going on over there relatively peaceful, and that has been relatively peaceful. Keep in mind, the first two world transforming events of this century, World War I and World War II, resulted in the loss of approximately 60 million lives. The meltdown of the evil empire and the Soviet communist system has so far resulted in the deaths of less than 100 people. When you think about it, that's nothing less than a miracle. And keeping it going is reason for active, generous, yet self-interested engagement on our part. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed.
floor is now open for questions. Yes, sir. Mr. Talbot, I first want to say I've enjoyed reading you in Time Magazine for many, many years. If we fail to follow the premise that you have just elucidated in your final comments, isn't there a danger that Germany and Japan would fill that vacuum and create further problems if we don't meet the challenge of what you outlined? I'm going to respond in part to what I am guessing may be a premise of your, your question, and if it's not a premise of your question, I apologize to you. Um, I sense, because I've heard the suggestion elsewhere, that the resurgence of Germany and Japan is itself a long-range security threat uh, to the United States. And that is simply not a fear that I yet share, that is, on the basis of what we've seen so far. My fear is that if we don't meet the challenge that I have described here, nobody, nobody will. It is simply a, question, a matter of fact that Germany has already done, not just on a proportional basis, that is, uh, taking into account the difference in the size of their population and economy much more than we, the United States, have done. Uh, they have done much more than we have done on an absolute basis as well. Now, to be sure, you know the old Tip O'Neill line that all politics is local. And for Germany, aid to the former Soviet Union is much more of an issue of obvious and apparent local political interest than it is for us being half a world away, because they are of course, terribly concerned about completing the process of the absorption of the Eastern, the former East Germany into the Federal Republic. And that means that they want, among other things, to do everything they can to keep reform in the old Soviet Union going. They also have several hundred thousand Russian or ex-Soviet troops on their territory whom they want to get out of there as quickly as possible. And they're, in effect, buying uh, a, uh, a continuation of the arrangement whereby those uh, troops are leaving. My own feeling is that, like it or not, we, the United States, continue to be the leader of the industrialized democracies. We are the only superpower still standing, however wobbly we may feel, on our feet for economic and other reasons, and that if the kind of support program that is required is going to take place with regard to the Soviet Union, it will only be in response to American leadership, which so far has simply not been forthcoming. Um, I was specifically thinking also about the uh, attraction that uh, Japan and Korea has on the eastern Siberian areas. Yes, and there's already talk about the western parts of the former Soviet Union becoming a Deutschmark zone and the eastern parts becoming a Yen zone. I'm not sure, however, that that necessarily militates uh, in favor of the actual breakup of Russia. It will depend in part on the way in which the Koreans and the Japanese condition their aid and their economic participation in those parts of Russia. And uh, they do not want to see Russia break up completely any more than the United States does. And so I think they will try to use their considerable economic influence uh, which in the case of the Japanese, by the way, is throughout Russia. Uh, in the case of the Koreans, is, is more in the eastern parts of Russia in order to, uh, to keep centrifugal forces from spinning out of control. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. At the same microphone. Me? I would just like to ask, in your opinion, sir, whether you think, whether you think Mr. Gorbachev has any future role in the Russia. I saw him 10 days ago. And I assure you, he thinks so. <laughs> but he did not persuade me of that. Part of, the, uh, part of the mystery to me of the Gorbachev phenomena, and I've uh, spent some years uh, observing it both from a distance and up close, part of the mystery, I think, can be explained by a kind of self-delusion that he has. And I don't mean this critically. I mean it more analytically, almost clinically. A self-delusion uh, that has convinced him long ago that he is indispensable to his country. 
Now, this is arguably, by the way, a characteristic that is ne needed in a leader who would deal with problems of the magnitude that Mikhail Gorbachev dealt with. But I saw him several days before he was forced to resign the presidency of the Soviet Union, namely because the state disappeared out from under him. And even then, he was convinced that he was still necessary as an, as an intermediary or an honest broker between Boris Yeltsin, the Russian leader, and particularly the, uh, the Ukrainians and the Central Asian leaders. He was wrong, of course. Uh, Yeltsin made very clear that he wasn't in the least necessary and he could go into retirement. When I saw him a little over a, a week ago, there is no question in my mind, he was by far the most optimistic, ebullient, uh, resilient person that I met uh, during my most recent trip uh, to Moscow. And that, as they say in Russian, is no accident. I'm sure that it's because he thinks that things, as things get worse, sooner or later, and people uh, are disillusioned with Yeltsin, sooner or later they're going to realize um, how much uh, they needed him before and how much they need him in the future. But my own guess is that there is enough residual resentment and unpopularity directed against him that he would not be able to come back in an elected capacity. Yes, sir. Uh, Strobe, the editors of some of your rival publications have suggested that the best way for Russia and the other republics to, uh, to achieve economic progress is to monetize the ruble or some success, successor currency by backing it with the incalculable natural resources, and minerals, timber, and even agricultural lands uh, of Russia and the other republics. Tsarist Russia was a net exporter of grain in about 1910 uh, with probably 15th century farming methods. Um, the when I was in Moscow, the, the inability of any kind of commerce to, to take place within the concept of just using the ruble was the thing that kept those things from happening. And clearly, under Soviet law, the ruble was not, uh, it was illegal to export it. It certainly wasn't convertible in any real sense. But if you had a currency that was convertible, that was stable, had a reasonably realizable uh, exchange ratio with the N and the Deutschmark, that jump starts the engine uh, that can, the economic engine that can be based on that vast natural resource. And I'm referring to your publications, Forbes and Fortune, that you, I'm sure you've read about. Uh, the problem with taking the ruble convertible is immense. If ob this is sort of an obvious statement, but if there were a, an easy way to make the ruble a convertible currency, it would have happened by now. It would have happened not just last year, but probably even earlier than that. The problem is this. Yes, they've got huge gold reserves, but the reserves are not so huge that the following danger wouldn't exist. If you put the ruble on a gold standard the way uh, you know the American dollar was once on a gold standard, there would be a run on that gold supply that would be the likes of which you could not imagine. I mean, it would, it, would, it would bring the country to a halt because everybody would be in line with all of his rubles you know, that he'd been saving in, literally in mattresses in many cases over the years in order to convert it into gold because nobody trusts the ruble. The gold standard only works for a currency if it has a kind of abstract quality to it. If people don't immediately try to turn in all of their dollars or rubles or whatever for gold. Now, you mentioned quite rightly that the uh, the former Soviet Union is, in terms of natural resources, an immensely wealthy country. And some way must be found, of course, to harness that natural wealth uh, to the economy. But so far, it hasn't been done. I referred to the Kazan or the Tatarstan oil fields. The, Russia and the former Soviet Union are by far the largest oil reserves in the world, dwarfing those of Saudi Arabia. And yet there are planes being grounded, air float flights being grounded in the former Soviet Union today because they don't have fuel. The problem is getting the oil out of the ground and getting it refined and getting it converted into a form that can be used. And until they can be, meet that problem, then the, the oil, you can't have, as it were, an oil-backed currency. That's why one of the key recommendations that everybody who has studied the Russian economy is now making is to have a, a currency stabilization fund, which will entail, you hear estimates of 7 to $15 billion 
put up not just by the United States by any means, but by the industrial, the G7 countries, the industrialized democracies as a whole, which would serve as a kind of backing or cushion for the ruble once you can establish what a fair rate of exchange is for the ruble. A similar currency stabilization fund was used in the case of Poland when it made the transition from a communist to a market economy several years ago, and it worked pretty well. The Polish economy is beginning to, to come around. But Russia has many problems that Poland doesn't, and it would certainly require a much larger fund. Thank you. Yes, sir, at the microphone. Given the immensity of the problems and the fact that the communism lasted 74 years and the Union for 70, despite all its illogicalities and contradictions, do you foresee a possibility that there may emerge a consensus in Russia and at least several of the former states that they just cannot go forward to a free market economy and that some return to communism and the union, if not under those names, under a different name is the only workable solution? Th that is a question so well considered and well expressed that all I can say is yes. <laughs> I do see that danger. I do see that danger, and people in Russia speak about it in precisely those terms. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things that happened as a result of the coup last August is that the Communist Party was abolished. Uh, it was declared illegal. Well, that's really only on paper. The Communist Party still exists. There are about six offshoots of it that are in very close touch with each other. There is talk about them going to the Russian parliament and asking in the name of free speech and, uh, and political, sort of a, their own political bill of rights to have the ban on the Communist Party lifted, in which case they would reform themselves, very possibly using the name communist, and would hold another party congress, and would then try to become what they have always been in the past, and that is the engine for a political movement that would take over the country again. So yes, that is very possible. And what is really ominous about this development is if the eco economic situation is dreadful enough and enough people uh, at the average workers and uh, white collar, blue collar, uh, housewives uh, are feeling that they are much worse off as a result of the end of communism than they were before the end of communism, they will, in a democratic fashion, support the reestablishment of communism, which, given the nature of the beast, I would argue, would then go about the process of whittling away democracy and reestablishing some kind of dictatorship. So that, that danger is very real. Yes. One reason that Secretary, I'll repeat the question, one reason Secretary Baker visited and has made a point of visiting the Central Asian Republics and the Muslim areas of the Transcaucasus is precisely because the United States is concerned that several Islamic countries uh, south of the soft underbelly of the former Soviet Union will try to fill the vacuum that has been created by the collapse of the communist regime. Uh, there are several countries which have already moved in in a major way to try to uh, influence events and win clients in the Islamic areas of Azerbaijan and then throughout uh, Soviet Central Asia. Iran, of course, is one of the most worrisome from the standpoint of the United States. Pakistan is already involved in there in a major way. Saudi Arabia is involved in a major way. Now, Saudi Arabia, of course, is our great buddy. Um, but I, for one, am not all that sanguine about the idea of Saudi Arabia playing a very active part in the former Soviet Union. Why? Because for reasons having to do with Saudi internal politics, the Saudis tend to back the Islamic fundamentalists because they're always trying to demonstrate to their own mullahs within Saudi Arabia how Islamically pure they are. And therefore, when they move into an area like uh, Kyrgyzia, Kyrgyzia or Tajikistan or Uzbekistan or some place like that, they tend to fan the fires of Islamic fundamentalism. The Islamic country 
which is among the most active in that part of the world, which I think we should most encourage to be active, is Turkey. Because Turkey, even though it is Islamic, is a secular democracy and therefore offers a model to the Islamic republics of the former Soviet Union. And incidentally has a great deal of influence because uh, many of them speak languages which are very close to uh, Turkish. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Talbot, first, uh, thank you for the wisdom of your comments tonight here. Uh, I have reference to the New Hampshire debates and to the scenario taking place uh, in the Democrat and Republican parties, which deals solely with the economic situation in the United States, which you referred to briefly. My question then is, uh, will the issue that you raised, uh, which asks for the United States to play a leading role uh, in the economic revitalization of Russia, uh, will that issue then wait until after November of this year, or will uh, part of the message that, uh, for instance, the Republicans bring out uh, state that uh, a part of the peace dividend has to go towards the things that you spoke of tonight? Will the Democrats address the issues that you've brought up? Um, and will all this play a role in the decision by the American people uh, of who the next president of the United States will be. Thank you. Best imaginable question. Uh, depends on us to a very large extent. I have a, a generalized prejudice about American politics, which is that uh, we the people tend to be a little smarter and wiser and more foresighted and farsighted than our leaders sometimes give us credit for. And people who call themselves leaders uh, and who aspire to being elected to positions of leadership very often, in fact, are following more than they are leading. And I think one reason for the strain of neo-isolationism, or whatever you want to call it, that is apparent in both parties at the moment, uh, stems from the fact that uh, the people reading the tea leaves, which is to say the polls, are convinced that the great American people in their wisdom, having uh, uh, celebrated both the end of the Cold War and the end of the Gulf War, now want uh, America to come home and tend to its knitting domestically. Uh, and uh, therefore, you see uh, the phenomenon that we've seen in, uh, in New Hampshire. And uh, as I was driving up here this afternoon, I heard some initial reports indicating that my fellow uh, columnist and newsman, uh, uh, Pat Buchanan, has done pretty darn well uh, in his uh, challenge to President Bush. And if that's the case, if that holds up uh, when the final returns are in, that will exacerbate this problem considerably because an important part of uh, Pat Buchanan's appeal, of course, in New, Hampshire, in New Hampshire has been an America First appeal. On the Democratic side, I have dutifully watched uh, all of the uh, televised debates, and I've been nothing less than appalled. I mean, I think there are many good things being said, and I have uh, a higher estimation than some of my colleagues in the press do of the field in general and a couple of the individual candidates in particular, but I've been appalled that um, foreign policy has basically dropped off the radar screen. Uh, in several of the debates, I noticed there was only one foreign country at all mentioned, one, Japan. And of course, as we all know, that's not a foreign policy issue, that's a domestic jobs issue. So I think whether uh, this trend continues will depend in large part uh, on the message that the candidates get back uh, from the people in some fashion. And I hope the message that comes back is, uh, you know, don't condescend to us. Don't, uh, don't assume that we, the American people, accept the proposition that there is a neat distinction between the world abroad and the world at home, between foreign policy and domestic pro policy. We Americans are sophisticated enough to know that that distinction has long since ended. It's an interdependent world. And uh, American security and indeed the health of the American economy depend on peace in the world as a whole, of which the future of the former Soviet Union uh, is an immensely important factor. can't wait to see how the Maryland primary goes. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mr. Talbot, <clears throat> what is the current status of the Russian army 
in East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. It's well known and documented that they uh, still control the Baltic states, such as Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. Well, uh, for starters, let me make the observation that there's no such thing as the Russian army. And I don't mean to be pedantic. It's an extremely important point. With all this talk about uh, what's going to happen to the Commonwealth of Independent States, it is worth remembering, or it's worth having my po me point out, that the former Soviet army is not the Russian army. It is the Commonwealth of Independent States army. And the commander-in-chief of what was the Soviet army, General Yevgeny Shapashnikov, does not answer to Boris Yeltsin. He has his, his own uh, nuclear suitcase. And Yeltsin has one, too, with the codes to control nuclear weapons. But Shapashnikov reports not to Yeltsin, but to a, an amorphous, fractious uh, committee made up of the heads of state of the Commonwealth members. And uh, the, Russian, the Soviet army, as a group, has been arguing very strenuously against being turned into the Russian army, which is one reason, by the way, why there's no defense minister in Russia now, because the military there does not want to acknowledge that its allegiance is solely to Russia. And part of the reason for this is because the, Russian, the Soviet army is uh, nostalgic for superpower status and not willing to give it up very easily. Now, as for your more specific question about the future of, uh, of Soviet forces still in Eastern Europe and indeed in the Baltic, uh, the problem there is really overwhelmingly a practical problem. It's what to do with these poor guys uh, if and when they come home. There are no jobs for them, and there are no houses for them. That's literally true. I have seen, on my own most recent trip there, tent cities. Uh, on the outskirts of, uh, of Moscow, and last year in Kiev as well, where uh, uh, units of, uh, of the Soviet army that had been brought back from Eastern Europe were being forced to live in absolutely wretched conditions. So once again, I know I'm being a bit of an Ivan one note here, but uh, once again, this is an argument for massive assistance by the outside world for our own good to do what we can to help generally in the conversion of what is a uh, grotesquely over-militarized economy to a civilian economy, and more specifically, to provide housing and jobs uh, for these uh, troops that uh, I think Boris Yeltsin really would like to get out of Eastern Europe, and indeed out of the Baltics as well. Thank you. Uh, in, in Two more questions. First at the microphone. Okay, in advocating assistance, could you be specific, and are you advocating aid in the magnitude of a Marshall Plan? Well, the Marshall Plan designation, of course, tends to yield itself to, to caricature, but uh, b because I have the, the uh, luxury of not having to worry about the political, political risks involved in this kind of thing, I would say yes. I think the Marshall Plan is not an outrageous uh, analog. We are, for all of our real troubles and for all of our considerable concern and well-justified concern with our real troubles, we are still a huge economy, a huge economy. And we can afford to assist the, so the former Soviet Union on a much larger scale than we are. Now, your question goes to the heart of the, the tricky follow-up to that is it's, we don't want to just make the symbolic gesture of pouring money down a rat hole because, first of all, that doesn't accomplish anything. What we need to do is have a clear idea of specific purposes that this money can be put to. I mean, what the, the effort that's going on right now, for example, the 54 Mercy flights of American military planes flying food aid in there is exactly what we ought not to be doing because it isn't doing the people there any good at all. I mean, basically, we are sending stuff over to places which are intended to send political signals, uh, not because the destinations really need the food aid. I mean, for example, Kiev is a net exporter of food to the rest of the former Soviet Union, and yet we're sending in a flight there in order to prove that we care about Ukraine as well as Russia. 
we are the food that we are sending uh, is uh, the contents of those mercy flights is determined by what's left over after the Kurdish relief effort of last year, which doesn't happen to coincide with what the people of the uh, former Soviet Union really need. For example, there's an awful lot of, uh, of uh, dried skim milk, uh, which is by no means uh, at the top of their uh, shopping list at the moment. Uh, and basically, what we've got going now is a exercise in public relations and in political symbolism. I would say that at the top of the list should be the currency stabilization fund, which will be immensely more expensive than anything we're doing now, but will do much more good over the long run. And then in a more general way, the point I made in my remarks about the need for a massive educational effort to teach these people the basics of a market economy. They use words like market, like profit, like efficiency, but they don't really understand what they mean because it's nothing in their own experience to back it up. And this is, by the way, an area for a huge effort on the part of the American private sector. Well, didn't the Marshall Plan, in fact, boost our own economy as well? Uh, thank you for helping me make my point. Uh, <laughs> yes, it did. But more important than boosting our own economy, more important than boosting our own economy, it created an international environment in which the United States could grow and prosper during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, that's what we're talking about. We're looking, this is, you know, George Bush uh, at that time of the Persian Gulf War liked to talk about defining moments. We have a defining moment right now for the 21st century. 